My apologies. Welcome everyone to this council meeting of the 5th of July, which is being live streamed. I'm Lydia Wilson, Chair Administrator at the City of Whittlesea, and I'd also like to now introduce my panel colleagues. Firstly, Ms Peter Duncan. Good evening. And secondly, Administrator Chris Eddy. Good evening, Chair. Uh, I'd also like to introduce our CEO, Mr Craig Lloyd, and ask him to introduce the council officers in attendance tonight. Uh, thank you and welcome everybody. Um, I'd like to introduce Executive Manager of Public Affairs, Ms Christy High, and Executive Manager of Governance, Mr Frank Joyce, Director of Community Wellbeing, Ms Kate McCacky, the Director of Corporate Services, Ms Amy Montalti, Director of Planning and Development, Mr Justin O'Mara, and the Director of Infrastructure and Environment, Ms Debbie Wood. Thank you, Chair. Almighty God, we ask for your blessing upon this council to make informed and good decisions to benefit the people of the city of Whittlesea. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Mr Lloyd. On behalf of the City of Whittlesea, I recognise the rich Aboriginal heritage of this country and acknowledge the Wurundjeri Willem clan as the traditional owners of this place. I'd also like to personally acknowledge Elders past, present and emerging. Uh, at this point, can I also just acknowledge that um, this is NAIDOC week. NAIDOC week is um, from the 4th to the 11th of July, and a critical theme is Heal Country. NAIDOC 2021 invites the nation to embrace First Nations cultural knowledge and understanding of country as part of Australia's national heritage and equally respect the culture and values of Aboriginal people and Torres Strait Islander as they do the cultures and values of all Australians. So it's just important to also note that it is NAIDOC week. I note that all administrators are present. Administrators, if you have a conflict of interest in any item on the notice paper, you may verbally disclose the type and nature of the interests now, but you must make a declaration immediately before consideration of the matter in question. Are there any items for which you have a conflict of interest to declare? No, Chair. No, Chair. And I also have no um, conflict of interest in any matter on the agenda. Uh, I seek a motion to confirm the minutes of the following preceding meeting, which was a scheduled meeting of Council held on the 1st of June 2021. Could I have a mover? So moved, Chair. Thank you, Administrator Eddy. And a seconder? Yes, Chair. Thank you, Administrator Duncan. I'll now put the matter to a vote. All those in favour of confirming the minutes? The motion is carried. Uh, I note that um, we have three questions from the public, uh, and I will read the questions and ask the Chief Executive Officer to respond to two of the questions. Uh, and then I understand that we have a third question that will be asked directly by somebody who's in the gallery this evening. Uh, so the first question is from Moira Deeming, and her question, and I quote, is, under Victorian law, is it legal for local government councils to provide sex-based targeted services and facilities separately to gender identity based targeted services and facilities? If not, why not? For example, can we legally put signs on a set of public toilets declaring that one is for biological males, including males with an intersex condition, one is for biological females, including biological females with an intersex condition, and one is for people with transgender identities of any biological sex. If not, 
Why not? Mr Lloyd? Yeah, thank you, Administrator Wilson. So the City of Whittlesea's shared vision with our community is a place for all. As part of the vision, we've made a commitment to provide inclusive infrastructure and services for all residents and visitors. Council aims to provide gender-neutral public toilets in its facilities wherever possible. Gender-neutral facilities are available in our new Ganbuka Linge Community Centre, a recently upgraded Mill Park Library, and will be part of the redevelopment of the Mill Park Basketball Stadium. Council also adheres to laws that provide guidance on how to make Victoria a safer, fairer and more inclusive state. This includes the Victorian Equal Opportunity Act 2010 and the Federal Sex Discrimination Act 1994, which was amended in 2013. These laws prohibit discrimination on the basis of sex, gender identity or intersex status. Under these laws, it is discriminatory to require a person who is transgender to use a toilet which does not align with their gender identity. We're also very supportive of the Victorian Gender Equality Act 2020, which highlights the need to redress disadvantage, address stigma, stereotyping, prejudice and violence against persons of different genders, and to enhance social participation by persons of different genders. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr Lloyd. Uh, we have another question from Thomas Watkins and Lynn Thumb, uh, and I note that the residents are in the council chamber tonight but did not want to speak to this item. But could I also just take the opportunity to note that this is the first council meeting uh, with our new governance rules whereby members of the public can actually ask their question and, um, and speak to their petition as well. Uh, the question from uh, Mr Watkins and Ms Farm is, and I quote, there are more and more young couples and families moving, moving to Laylaw and bringing their dogs with them. However, there is only one dog park in Laylaw that is on the far west side of the suburb. We would like to ask the council to create a dog park on the east side of the suburb like those in Bandura and Mill Park. Stockade Park is rarely used by residents. This space would be ideal for a dog park. So my question to the council is, is it in the council's power to make this happen? Do I need a petition? If yes, how many signatures are required for council to genuinely consider this? Uh, and again, Mr Lloyd, if I could ask you to respond to that question. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you for your question. The City of Whittlesea's future dog off-leash areas are guided by Council's dog off-leash area policy and management plan available on Council's website. The plan considers locations based on size attributes and features include minimum size requirements and existing infrastructure. VR Michael Reserve in Laylaw has been identified as a suitable location for a dog off-leash area and will be considered as part of the 22-23 annual budget process. We would accept a petition of at least 12 signatures. However, we welcome residents to have their say as part of the budget process each year and we'll provide more information on how to do this in early 2022, if not before. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Lloyd. Uh, and we have a further question from Mr Watkins. And Mr Watkins, if I could invite you to come up and um, to feel free to ask your question directly. And welcome to the council meeting. Uh, does that sound all right? Yep. Yes, that's perfect. Thank thanks, you. For, uh, thanks for having me speak tonight. Um, evening, everyone. My name's Thomas Watkins. Uh, we did ask that question just before, but uh, today I uh, had another question I wanted to raise, so I thought I'd bring it up while we're here. Um, I was at the Partridge Street uh, Reserve today, which is on Partridge Street in Laylaw, um, just east of the station, uh, Laylaw train station. Now, we moved into the area about 18 months ago. During COVID, it was quite clean, very, very nice because it wasn't being used. It was being regularly maintained as well. As far as I could tell, the lawns were being mowed fairly regularly. Um, now, Mill Park Soccer Club has moved in there maybe six months ago now. Um, it's honestly filthy. It's quite disgusting most of the time. Um, I understand that uh, Partridge Street Reserve is a uh, council park. Um, it seems quite bizarre that they're allowed to just leave rubbish everywhere all the time, broken glass. Um, it looks like there might even be kids you know, or teenagers drinking there. 
at the nights. Um, but yeah, generally it's quite filthy. I'm talking about on the fields, around the fields, around the club in general. Um, I did write an email to council today with a number of photos. Um, specifically, they, they seem to have had an event on the weekend. Um, they'd split the fields up into, it looked like four fields. So there's a lot of people there. The streets had, I don't know, hundreds of cars all over the place. I've never seen anything like this. My partner Ling and I, she's over there, we were picking up rubbish. They had literally attached plastic bags to the fences for people to put rubbish in. Didn't seem to have achieved anything. Um, absolutely filthy. Look, I'm talking hundreds, hundreds of pieces of rubbish. Chip packets, Tim Tam packets at the soccer, Gatorade bottles, water bottles, anyhow. The question is, and I understand council gets quite a number of questions about rubbish in the area, what can be done about this? This is obviously council land. Um, Mill Park, I don't know if they pay a fee or they get it for free, I'm not sure how it is, but surely they have, surely Mill Park Soccer Club has some sort of uh, remit to keep it clean. Uh, thank you, Mr Watkins. I'm going to hand over to our CEO to respond, sure. and he might also want to take the question on notice, but I yeah. just wanted to note that um, through our council plan consultations, a key theme was certainly dump rubbish and litter across the municipality. But Mr yeah. Lloyd. Yeah, thank you, Chair. So I will have to take that on notice to get a little bit more information, but I'll certainly have one of our directors over here um, contact you and, and come out and have a look uh, for ourselves and see what's happening there. Um, and we will also liaise with the relevant club there to see uh, what occurred over the weekend as well. But we'll, we'll get back to you in the next couple of days. Thank you very much. Thank, thank thanks you. for raising Thank that. you, Mr Watkins, for coming along this evening and also for sending the email and the photo. So I'm sure that that will be really handy to council officers. So thanks for your attendance this evening. And you're welcome to stay for the rest of the council meeting. Okay. Thank appreciate you. appreciate the opportunity to ask the uh, first question. Yes, you did. <laughs> Thank you. The very first question with our new governance rules. So we appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, I note we have one joint letter from 11 residents relating to the objection of the planning permit application unit 7 slash 21 Brand Drive, Thomastown. Uh, I note that the lead petitioner did not want to speak to the joint letter submitted. Therefore, could I ask you, Mr Lloyd, to please read the specific request from residents in the letter? Thank you, Chair. We wish to formally document our joint strong objection to the planning application for the following reasons. One, the nature of the application undermines our existing businesses, given the fact that our premises are in an industrial one zone area. It is unsafe and unreasonable to have anyone living here. Some of us have heavy equipment and or trucks coming and going at all hours of the day, given the nature of our work. If we were operating in a residential area, this would be unacceptable, so it is illogical to allow a residential dwelling to be constructed in an industrial area. Two, in the past, there have been complaints of noise by people who were living in our factory complex. In fact, it is the applicant of this application that was one, one of the ones complaining at the time that he was living at Factory 15. We fear that should the approval be given for a caretaker permit, further noise complaints will be made and this would further restrict our trade, which is under industrial one zoning, should not be a concern we have. Three, should this application be approved, the value of our property will suffer. Should the time come to sell up, it will be harder to sell when there is a residential dwelling in the complex. This may add to the time required to sell the premises and may reduce the sale price. This is commercially unjust and hence forms another point of objection. Four, approving the application would set a dangerous precedent where theoretically every factory could have residents. This would only serve to further deteriorate the industrial one zoning we have all bought and paid for and we, all, and we therefore find it is further unacceptable risk. Five, if people live here, then we expect that they will also have visitors here. This further adds to the risk of the complex by having people around that would not otherwise need to be here. This adds to the risk of pedestrian traffic and associated public liability risk, loss of car parking or even potential crime. In summary, we strongly believe the, that approving the permit application will undermine our rights to use industrial one's owned land as the planning scheme intended. Accordingly, we cannot stress enough that this planning application should be stressed, uh, rejected. We all would wish to be notified of the decision. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr Lloyd. Administrators, are there any questions? No, Chair. No, Chair. Uh, there being no questions, is an administrator happy to table the joint letter? Yes, Chair. 
Um, I move that Council resolve to, one, receive the joint letter from 11 residents objecting to the planning permit application number 2021-719852 for unit, two, uh, unit 7, sorry, 24 Brand Drive, Thomastown, and consider the joint letter in conjunction with the Council report on this planning permit application at the Council meeting scheduled on 2nd of August 2021. Thank you, Administrator Duncan. Do I have a seconder? Yes, Chair. I Thank second. you. Thank you, Administrator uh, Eddy. Uh, and would the mover or seconder like to speak to the motion? No. Uh, accordingly, I'll put that motion to a vote. All those in favour? The motion is carried. Uh, administrators will now work through the agenda and obviously we've got a large council agenda with some very important council reports this evening to consider. Uh, the first item, 6.1.1 for decision, is arts and culture in the city of Whittlesea. And if I could invite our Director of Community Wellbeing, Ms Kate McCackie, to come forward and provide a brief summary of the report and the recommendation. Thank you, Chair. Um, arts and culture uh, in the City of Whittlesea um, offered by our services um, includes free public events that have a positive impact on increasing community cohesion, uh, uh, wellbeing and also the local economy. Uh, in December 2020, Council resolved to refocus and review the City of Whittlesea's festivals and events program with an aim to really um, get our head around what the future means, particularly within a COVID normal recovery environment. Um, and also to bring a report back to Council on this matter by July 2021. So this report really addresses that resolution. Um, and the, uh, we, primarily we're, we're recommending that we um, provide a place-based uh, festivals and events program in the 2021-22 financial year. And that really focuses on um, a number of smaller place-based events throughout the city and, and a larger, uh, more significant civic -wide, uh, municipal-wide event um, based at the Civic Centre and Plenty Rages Arts and Convention Centre. And that'll take place in early 2022. Um, uh, we also, the report also um, recommends that Council note the, the community consultation engagement undertaken in the development of the festival and events program. Um, and that found really um, a big committee interest in music, street, theatre, craft, food trucks, outdoor cinemas. Um, uh, and also another really big theme of that was just a, a lot, lots of activities for um, children, young people, families, and a big focus and call for um, events which celebrated Aboriginal culture as well. Um, only 5% of the 450 respondents um, identified said they would like to see fireworks as part of the festivals and events program moving forward. Um, and finally, it proposes to, to prepare a draft Whittlesea 2040 Connected Community Strategy, which includes arts and culture priority areas um, and also um, would look at um, uh, sort of arts and cultural infrastructure as part of that consideration as well. Thank you. Thank you, Ms McCackie. Um, I wondered if I could start the ball rolling with um, a couple of initial questions. Yeah. Um, you noted uh, that there have been a number of community consultation processes and surveys that have been undertaken to inform yeah. the report, uh, both within the report and your comments earlier. Can you just again clarify what they have been? Yeah, so a significant um, consultation process for this, um, for this report was uh, um, so face to face consultation taken, that took place during the um, summer festivals and events program that happened. So we had a whole range of sort of in engagement activities that people could um, come back and everything from picture boards and um, things like that where people could sort of talk about what they're interested in. Um, we also included a components of these questions in the community plan consultation as well. And that's really formed the basis of this, um, that, this feedback for. And it's, it's just for the 2021-22 and we'll continue to review it um, as the program rolls, rolls forward. Thank you, Mr. Kaki. Um, secondly, I note in the report that there is a table mm -hmm. indicating um, the allocation in the current budget, 2021-22, yep. for festivals and events. Yep. I wonder whether you could confirm whether there's any other budget provision this year for other events mm -hmm. or activities, in, including 
the Whittlesea show? Or yeah, so that's namely through our grants program and also we'll be looking at other opportunities through some of our economic development um, and visitor attraction initiatives as well. Okay, thank yep. you, Ms McCackie. Uh, any further questions from administrators? Administrator Eddy. Thank you, Chair. Um, I note one of the issues canvassed was the use of fireworks, mm -hmm. um, but we're not being asked to make any particular resolution in relation to that. I wonder if you could just explain a bit more what that current uh, decision-making process around fireworks looks like. Yeah, sure. So the decision making uh, is it's really um, about a, a range of um, critical uh, risk assessments in relation to the event itself. So at this point in time, um, Council's Festivals and its program isn't proposing to include any fireworks in the 2021-22 program. However, um, from time to time we get requests for community run events to use fireworks and the process for approval of that is to go through Fire Safe Victoria because they need to provide, um, they need to issue per permits and licences for the use of fireworks and we really look at it on a case by case basis looking at environmental um, uh, noise, amenity issues etc in terms of the, um, the location, the timing etc. So nothing's really changed in terms of that authorisation process other than the introduction of Fire Rescue Victoria? Yeah, so those yeah. formal processes, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, my other question, if I may, is around, uh, there's a comment there about um, exploring the provision of a dedicated art space. I wonder if you might say a bit more around the thinking there, and I'm interested to understand what sort of an art collection we have that yep. could benefit from having a dedicated yep. space? So Council has over 400 items in its um, arts and cultural collection at the moment. Um, that ranges everything from paintings on walls through to public art out in the, in the you know, parklands and street, um, streetscapes. Uh, at this point in time, arts infrastructures um, that's been looked at at the moment um, will include a number of options. That might be for a dedicated standalone facility, it might be part of an enhanced offering of an existing facility, or it might be um, uh, a more decentralised approach that could um, be an exhibition space in a community activity centre, etc. So I think there's a lot of different options for how Council could really showcase and enhance its collection. Its collection is really reflects the city of Whittlesea itself, so there's a big component in the collection of um, river red gums, which is an iconic um, piece of um, flora of this city, and so it's got some really lovely themes and it would be great to showcase and celebrate that. Terrific. Thank you. Any further questions? If not, um, I'm happy to move the officer recommendation for item 6.1.1. Uh, do I have a seconder? Second. Thank you, Administrator Eddy. Uh, as um, our director indicated, uh, this report follows from the council decision in December 2020 that we would be looking to refocus our festival and event program. Uh, I personally strongly support the provision of the five smaller events across the municipality. The night walking event, which obviously the previous event was a major success in terms of take up and um, neighbourhood connection uh, and also a major community festival. Um, I also really particularly support the dates of recognition calendar which picks up on really important dates, uh, festivals and events such as obviously NADOC week, freezer events, but also where there are other major events across the municipality that might not be directly provided by council. And I refer to the Whittlesea uh, Country Music Festival and the Whittlesea Show and also library uh, events. Um, I just really wanted to conclude by saying this is not the end of the process. Um, as um, Ms McCackie indicated, there will be further work to um, under that Whittlesea 2040 connected community strategy uh, for a whole lot of um, further initiatives to be looked at and investigated. Uh, and further to um, Administrator Eddy's comment, one of the uh, things that has been included for further work is really in relation to Council's collection management um, overview, including storage and display of our collection. Uh, so I'm, I strongly support the officer recommendation. Uh, Administrator Eddy, did you wish, wish to speak to the item as well? Thank you, Chair. Yes, to support your comments, uh, I, I think there's a very interesting um, 
a trend of, uh, I guess, a decline in interest in fireworks uh, generally, which seems to be borne out by, uh, for very good reasons, I, I would add, uh, by this, uh, this review and the data. But do note that, for the most part, uh, other bodies have a role to play in determining whether fireworks are appropriate on public land. So that's just to note that particular point, which I know can be quite emotive uh, in the community. Uh, and in relation to the art collection and having a dedicated space, I, I think it's, uh, it's a terrible shame to have such a collection that's not being able to be enjoyed by the community. And I fully support the, uh, the thinking around exploring um, a more appropriate way of, of, in, of, of allowing everyone to enjoy such, such a collection. So. I'm happy to second the motion on that basis. Thank you, Administrator Eddy. Uh, I'll now put the item to a vote. All those in favour? The motion is carried. Item 6.1.2 for noting final progress report Council's Disability Action Plan 2017 to uh, 21. Uh, and again, Ms McCacky, if I could ask you to provide a brief overview of the report and its recommendation. Thank you, Chair. Um, this report uh, provides a summary of the progress and outcomes of the City of Whittlesea's Disability Action Plan, um, known as the DAP, from 2017 to 21. Um, uh, it also notes the findings of the recent community consultation undertaken as part of the community plan, uh, the new community plan, um, and it also recommends um, the integration of the new um, Disability Action Plan into the community, pl the, the community plan. Um, so this is a, an important piece of work because the City of Whittlesea has a large popula population of residents with a, disabil with a disability. Um, 35,249 people in, uh, live in, um, um, with a disability in Whittlesea. Um, that's um, nearly 16% of our population and that's higher than the Melbourne Metro average. Um, it also has 22, uh, nearly 23,000 people who are unpaid carers living in the city as well. So that's a really significant statistic and why this work is just so important. Um, some, some significant outcomes achieved in the uh, last step include the development of an all abilities playground at Mill Park and that was in the planning for over 15 years and is a major, major achievement for the, for the city um, and the community. Um, we increased access for residents with disabilities as part of the Mill Park Leisure Centre redevelopment. Um, we delivered a, a Marvaloo portable change facility for events which is now available for all our, of our events. Um, and we also increased um, our changing places facilities from three to eight, which is a lot more, I mean, a lot of municipalities in Melbourne don't have one. So the fact that we've got that many um, within the municipality over the period as well, and that really enhances the ability for community members to participate um, across the city. Um, and we also did a lot of work with the Victorian government on the accessible parking scheme. So they're just a, a bit of a summary of some of the highlights. Um, the consultation we undertook for the community plan on disability, around disability issues, um, um, identified that there was a, um, a real need to increase community information sharing of disability services programs and events, what's really out there and how people get access to that information, um, to increase um, community capacity building for people with a disability in the city, um, and to also increase their civic participation opportunities. Um, accessible housing was a huge um, a, a issue that also emerged. Um, and um, also employment and training as well, um, so including things like support for um, entrepreneurs with a disability. Some, some really inter innovative and interesting sort of feedback that came um, as, part of the, um, as part of that engagement process. Um, and so um, moving forward, we're proposing to um, integrate uh, the future disability plan into the community plan um, uh, to ensure a whole of organisation approach and an ability to generate greater community outcomes and have all parts of council thinking about this issue in an integrated way. Um, and that's really in line with um, uh, some of the objectives of the, uh, the Disability Act and broader legislative frameworks as well. Um, and so, as I said, the, the recommendations are to um, note the outcomes in the Disability Action Plan um, and also the community feedback for the future community plan um, and that it will be integrated um, into the, um, the community plan moving forward. Thank you. Thank you, Ms McCackie. Uh, administrators, do you have any questions in relation to this report? Uh, yes, Jen. Uh, Ms McCackie, I note in the uh, report here that there are five actions that weren't achieved in the current plan. Yeah. 
and I'm just wondering what the mechanism will be in place to investigate those and perhaps reactivate those in future plans. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, um, Administrator um, Duncan. Um, so, yeah, we will be looking at those. Um, some, of them, some of them weren't achieved due to COVID, but by and large, sometimes it just, well, we didn't get the funding. So we are going to look at um, how we can pick up, particularly around the um, employment and training, um, and look at that in terms of the, um, the committee plan and other uh, Wilsey 2040 strategies as well, most definitely. And happy to report back to that, um, to that end. As, to thank that you. End. Administrator Eddy. Uh, thank you, Chair. Ms McCackie, I'm wondering if there was any feedback in relation to the, um, the move to absorb, if you like, the Disability Action Plan into the broader community plan. Uh, were there any concerns expressed about that? Um, th there has been some ongoing discussion with stakeholders around the what happens to the visibility of the Disability Action Plan if it's um, incorporate into a broader strategic plan. Um, one, of the, one of the ways that we're looking to make sure that it's really clear that um, what actions are really trying to promote greater accessibility within the city um, will be the use of special icons within the community plan that denote that this is a disability plan action um, item. And I think there'll be a really good visibility of that in that way. So we're hoping that really it's an enhancement of resources and effort toward that objective as opposed to a, um, a sort of siloing of it to a certain extent. Yep. So, if I may follow a question, in, internally within the organisation, uh, have you given some thought to how you're going to ensure that, that the appropriate focus and priority is still yeah. maintained on those actions? Yeah, certainly. So, I think, I think the most important thing will be through budgeting processes, that there's a lens around disability um, uh, initiatives and accessibility initiatives um, through, the, so through the Capital Works Program, um, that there's really good mechanisms for what is proposed with our Woodsy Disability ne Network, which are a really critical sort of stakeholder group and um, that they have a lens in terms of what's proposed as well so getting that um, lived experience feedback into the process. Thank you. Thank you Ms McCackie. Do I have a mover for the officer recommendation for item 6.1.2? I'm happy to move this item chair. Um, I'm happy to move the officer recommendation for 6.1.2 but with a new part four and that is seeks a further report by October 2021 in relation to those actions not achieved within the current Disability Action Plan, namely the Business Support Program, Disability Work Experience Employment Pilot, establishment of an Access Inclusion Coordinating Group and a training program for staff. Thank you, Administrator Duncan. I was hoping, here it is, yep. it's projected now on the screen. Thank you for that. Uh, and I'm happy to second the item with the, um, uh, with the new part four as shown on the screen. Would you like to speak to the motion? I would, thank you, Chair. <laughs> <laughs> um, I really just want to commend the extensive work that has occurred by council officers uh, together with community members, um, advocates and stakeholders and agencies and we just need to ensure that outstanding commitments are not lost and hence that's why the part four to the recommendation has been added, but well done. Uh, thank you, Administrator Duncan, and, and I would just echo that comment. I think the additional uh, part to the recommendation is really important to ensure that those items that had not been completed from the Disability Action Plan uh, are captured. Uh, and I think, Ms McCackie, your responses to the questions from administrators regarding the visibility and the importance of making sure that the um, new actions will come under the integrated community plan framework, which I broadly support, but um, not to lose the focus on um, the disability action plan items themselves. But I think you also make a really important point, which is about the importance of ensuring that there is a whole of organisation approach rather than from just one section of the organisation. So I'm happy to second the um, officer recommendations with the new part on that basis. I'll now put the item to a vote. All those in favour? The motion is carried. Thank you, Ms McCackie. 
Uh, item 6.1.3 for decision, uh, Aboriginal Gathering Place. And again, Ms McCacky will be providing a brief overview of the report together with uh, a summary of the recommendations. But could I just acknowledge that we've got a number of people in the gallery this evening uh, from the Whittlesea Reconciliation Group, but also some of our own staff. Uh, and uh, I just want to acknowledge their presence this evening for this very important report. Uh, Ms McCackie, over to you. Great. Thank you, Chair. Um, the vision for an Aboriginal gathering place in the city of Whittlesea is for a welcoming, inclusive, culturally safe space where all Aboriginal people have a sense of belonging and have access to activities, programs and services which strengthen, strengthen culture and enhance wellbeing. Um, and, an, uh, and an important component of this, this critical vision is that um, it, will, it will strengthen um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander wellbeing, and that's fundamentally at its core. But also importantly, it will also foster reconciliation um, between Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal um, communities in Whittlesea. Um, the idea for a gathering place was um, initiated by local community members over 20 years ago, and this really is a community-led um, initiative that's here before you tonight. Um, and this inclu includes considerable work by both the Whittlesey um, Reconciliation Group and then the, Abor the A Aboriginal Gathering Place Governance Group. Um, uh, in essence, this report, uh, after looking at many sites across the city, um, proposes um, the establishment of um, a purpose-built Aboriginal Gathering pla pa Place at Quarry Hills Regional Park, um, as articulated in option four of the report. Um, it's uh, also proposed that if, if adopted, the uh, Aboriginal Gathering Place will be included as a major initiative with, within Council's health and Municipal Public Health and Wellbeing Plan, which is going to be incorporated into the community plan as well. Um, and really its aim is to enhance wellbeing um, and reconciliation for everybody in Whittlesea, as well as, and, and in particular, the Aboriginal community. Um, and as Barry Firebrace, um, one of our officers, said, um, this really should be called a place of belonging. And for a city that has over a third of its people born overseas, um, the second largest population of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders living in Metro Melbourne, um, and um, a, a, new neighbor, a new suburb popping up every month, belonging is really critical to us all, and this will be a really important anchoring um, initiative um, in terms of the health and wellbeing of the city for generations to come. And so it's, there's quite a significant number of um, uh, recommendations, but they include to support the establishment of a purpose-built Aboriginal gathering place at the Quarry Hills Park, as described in option four. Um, note the following, a number of funding arrangements for the project um, in 2021-22, namely the council's commitment of 250,000 plus external funding from the Department of Environment, Land, Water and Planning of, of 300,000. Um, note a number of uh, really important gathering place documents prepared that really um, sort of build the vision and the, the, the framework for this, for this um, initiative, um, such as the um, community vision, the feasibility study, et cetera, et cetera, and, and, the, business, and the business case. Um, note that, uh, that Council will be establishing a formal Aboriginal gathering place advisory group to provide advice to Council throughout the development of this project. Um, note that we'll pursue external funding um, for a co-contribution target of 50% towards the facility um, uh, and that a report will be brought back to Council by March 2022 outlining a final Aboriginal Gathering Place business case um, because um, there is, uh, it's not in our long-term financial plan at the moment so there's a bit more work that we need to do to really understand um, what's involved, what the financial implications are and also to do a bit more feasibility on the site because um, it's quite a challenging site technically to, to construct um, facilities etc. And lastly, to note that completion of a cultural heritage management plan with the Wurundjeri Wairong Cultural Heritage Aboriginal Corporation will be commissioned, and that may also impact on program delivery timeframes, depending on what's found, etc. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. McCacky. Uh, before I ask administrators whether they've got any questions, I just wanted to acknowledge that not only do we have representatives this evening from the Whittlesea Reconciliation Group, but also from the Whittlesea Gathering Place Governance Group. So. Uh, welcome again. Um, administrators, do you have any questions relating to this item? Administrator Eddy? Thank you, Chair. I do have one question. Um, if I understand correctly, there's 
I think 14 gathering places in Victoria, but none in the northern metropolitan area. I just wonder what's the, the um, uh, prospect, I guess, of this being a much bigger, uh, in terms of its appeal and reach facility from a regional or even you know, state sort of significance level? Yeah, look, I, um, I think that would, would really depend on ongoing feedback with the uh, um, Gathering Place Advisory Group, but certainly um, councils are talking to other, we're talking to other neighbouring councils about the opportunity to um, explore what they're doing in terms of that, that sort of regional approach moving forward. Um, gathering Places, all the evidence seems to imply that Gathering Places work when they work from the grassroots up. So. Um, if there's that grassroots support for that as a that regional concept, then then obviously we'll, we'll progress mm. with it. But um, that principle seems to be fundamental to all the successful ones. So we'd want to make sure that that was an integral component. But it wouldn't preclude necessarily a broader remit if that worked. Okay. Thank you. Any further questions? Uh, do I have a mover then for the officer recommendation for item 6.1.3 and Administrator Duncan, I see that you would like to move this item. I'm happy to move the item, Chair. I'm happy to move uh, the officer recommendation for item 6.1.3 but with a new part 8 and I'm not sure if that will be on the screen. There we go. Um, all right, I've lost my spot now because I'm a bit excited. Um, okay, um, the addition there to include the Whittlesea Aboriginal Gathering Place is a key advocacy priority for the 2021-22 in partnership with the Aboriginal Gathering Place Advisory Group. Thank you, Administrator Duncan. And I'm happy to second the officer recommendation with that new part eight, but with also a new part nine, uh, which reads, amend the terms of reference for the Aboriginal Gathering Place Advisory Group to include under ordinary meetings, the provision to formally meet with administrators on a biannual basis. I was just about to ask <laughs> Administrator Duncan whether you were happy to accept my further amendment. I to... do accept that, Chair. Thank you, Administrator Duncan. Would you like to speak to the item? Um, yes, thank you. Um, I think this is a proud night for the City of Whittlesey to, um, to have the Gathering Place project um, agreed to hopefully by the vote, um, I've just been a bit presumptuous there, um, and that it will be built at the Quarry Hills Regional Parkland. And I think it's a particularly proud night because it is the start of NAIDOC week and to be able to have this item on the agenda tonight. Um, I think it's safe to say that the gathering place will be a welcoming and in inclusive and culturally safe space with strong emphasis on self-determination and environmental sustainability and not just for our Aboriginal community, but for all, and part of that healing process of bringing the broader community into the gathering place to understand the rich Aboriginal culture of our country, but also within Whittlesea. Um, I do would, I want to really acknowledge, I know we have some of the uh, Whittlesea Reconciliation Group here, Chair, which you've mentioned, um, and the advise, uh, Aboriginal Gathering Place Governance Group, tongue twisters there, um, but I did want to actually reflect on our elders past and that is the late Uncle Reg Blow, whose vision for the Gathering Place it, it initiated this project over 20 years ago, along with support from Uncle Herb Patner and the late, late Auntie, Auntie um, Bunta. So I just wanted to, to acknowledge those past elders of their vision is finally um, coming to realisation now and particularly with the help of the, the current WRG and those that have been on the journey for that whole time, um, including Karen Bryant, who's here tonight, and others. So I think it was important to do that. But that's all I've got to say. Chair. Thank you, Administrator Duncan. And like you, I think it's very fitting that we're resolving on this item during NAIDOC week. I think it's quite symbolic given the history of the work that has been undertaken and the advocacy over many years. Uh, I just wanted to make a couple of other points, which um, are that the gathering place 
is really um, a place for Aboriginal people, but equally it'll be a place for non-Aboriginal people to enjoy, to learn more about the experience and engage with Aboriginal culture and history. Uh, and I think that, um, as I indicated, it's been a long time coming because there's been advocacy and considerable work over 20 years to get to the point that we are now. But I just wanted to note that the um, council report and all of the different documents that are appended to the council report, including the development of a community vision, uh, a, a preliminary business case, the feasibility study and the terms of reference is just uh, an absolutely enormous amount of work and I really wanted to acknowledge the efforts of uh, council staff, of uh, advocates, of the Gathering Place Governance Group and obviously of the Willsey Reconciliation Group because it is an amazing amount of work that has occurred. Uh, and I think it's important to note that we did also look at the examples of gathering places that are already in existence to be able to understand and learn from what has already gone on before. Uh, as um, our director indicated, we will be further considering uh, this report by March 2022 when there will be the final business case uh, presented. Uh, and the only reason that I wanted the additional recommendation is that I felt that it's terribly important that we have the advisory group uh, with the ability to come and present directly to administrators at least twice a year uh, so that we can hear firsthand the progress uh, in relation to this really important project. So again, congratulations to all involved in getting to the point that we are today and I've been very happy to second this item. Thank you. Uh, I'll now put the item to a vote. All those in favour? The motion is unanimously carried. Thank you. Uh, item 6.1.4 for decision, City of Whittlesea Community Awards Committee representation. Uh, and if I could invite our Executive Manager Governance, Mr Frank Joyce, to briefly speak to this item. Thank you, Chair. Um, as you'd be aware, on the 4th of May 2021, at the Council meeting, Council adopted the City of Whittlesea Community Awards terms of reference and set the awards categories for 2021. Um, and also appointed Administrator Peter Duncan as the Administrator Representative on the Awards Committee. So the decision was made to um, seek, to contact the existing, the members of the former Australia Day Awards Committee to invite them to submit an expression of interest to um, join the inaugural Community Awards Committee. Seven former members of the um, Australia Day Awards Committee submitted an expression of interest to join the Community Awards Committee and it's being proposed that all seven um, members uh, be accepted and invited to join the committee. The proposed committee members represent the diversity of the local Whittlesea community in relation to age, ability, gender, cultural background and location within the municipality and they've all been recognised for their contribution to the community either as uh, former members of the community representatives of the committee or as a st former Australia Day recipients, um, some being recognised as senior citizen of the year, some as young person of the year and as access and inclusion citizen of the year. So through the expression of interest um, process, they all showed a passion for the city of Whittlesea and making a difference to the local community and bring a range of expertise through their work and um, volunteering in their, in their personal um, and work lives. So um, in conjunction with the members of the Community Awards Committee at the first meeting and the Council of Public Affairs team, it's proposed that a communication and engagement plan is prepared to ensure that we can promote the awards and seek nominations. It's expected to include a multi-pronged approach to encourage award nominations, including the use of websites, social media, and also directly contacting community groups and organisations and committees to encourage their nominations. 
The awards will be held later this year, which is really exciting, um, and the initial meeting of the awards committee is proposed to be occur in a few weeks' time. So I'm pleased to put forward the recommend recommendation that Council appoint the seven residents as community representatives to the City of Whittlesea Community Awards Committee for the conduct of the inaugural Community Awards for the 2021 period. Thank you, Mr Joyce. Administrators, do you have any questions in relation to this item? No? Uh, so uh, do I have a mover then for the officer recommendation for item 6.1.4? Yes, Chair. Thank you, Administrator Duncan. And a seconder? Thank you, Chair. Um, I would like to second this, but with the agreement of the mover, I'd like to suggest a couple of extra words in dot point three of the motion, and that is to publish the list of committee members, including the Council's appointed delegate, Administrator Peter Duncan, on the Council's website, just for the sake of completeness. Administrator Duncan, are you happy with that amendment? I'm happy with that, Chair. Thank you. Um, would the mover like to speak to this item? Um, really just to say, Chair, I think um, it's great that we have expanded out our awards uh, program to where it was and uh, that the, uh, the people that will join the committee to select our winners this year have come across um, from the municipality of different ages, ability, gender, professional, cultural um, diversity, which just shows you the breadth of what um, resides in the city of Whittlesea. And they've all been recognised for their contribution to the community as either former Australia Day Award recipient recipients or through demonstration of, and passion for their local community. So I think this is a, a great start for the first uh, committee with those people on there to select our winners. Thank you, Administrator Duncan. And uh, Administrator Eddy, would you like to speak to the item? Nothing really to add other than that this has my complete support, Madam Chair. Thank you. I'll put the item to a vote. All those in favour? The motion is carried. Item 6.1.5 for decision, COVID-19 pandemic recovery fund. Uh, and if I could ask our Chief Executive Officer if he would like to present on this item. Uh, thank you, Chair, and it's unusual for me to get to present a paper, uh, but um, the manager responsible for this, Neville Kurth, is currently deployed in the Yarra Ranges, assisting after the storm event down there, assisting the crisis team. Council has undertaken an extensive community consultation process to develop actions for a $2 million COVID-19 pandemic recovery fund. The consultation explored community perspectives to guide the rollout of the fund via a community participatory budget working group. As part of the community plan consultation process, a group of residents were randomly selected to participate in the budgeting workshop. The group was representative of the diversity of the municipality and 32 residents participated over three sessions of three hours each. At each workshop, participants were briefed on the impact of the pandemic across the four Whittlesea 2040 goals to inform the discussion. And the group were led through a series of facilitated activities and smaller group work over three sessions which they then developed a final list of 17 recommendations or action items that they then voted on as individuals to prioritise. The recovery fund actions aim to support recovery across the four disaster recovery environments of social, economic, environmental and built infrastructure. The predominant themes of the economic development and local jobs and support for vulnerable communities and local service providers will complement programs already established in the relief phase, such as the Business Mentoring Program and the Emergency Relief Funds Grant Program. Therefore, I recommend uh, to Council that Council resolve to acknowledge the Community Participatory Budget Working Group for their work in co-designing with Council the Recovery Fund Actions adopt the COVID-19 pandemic recovery fund actions, which are attached to the report, and note that the COVID-19 pandemic recovery fund actions will be reported on a quarterly basis via the community plan reporting process. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr Lloyd. Administrators, do you have any questions in relation to this item? Administrator Eddy? 
Thank you, Chair. I'm just wondering, Mr CEO, if you could talk a little bit about what sort of, there's a few individual funding streams in this package. What sort of uh, processes are going to be put in place to ensure that funding goes um, based on need and merit effectively? Yeah, thank you, Administrator. So uh, the, the bulk of this funding will be managed in the same way that the community plan or council plan uh, budget will be managed. So lots of reporting and information uh, back to council. Some of the funding that's included in this package complements existing funds of council where we're topping up existing programs. Those that are direct funding to community groups will be managed as community grants. Uh, and Council will shortly be considering a new grants program and new governance arrangements for, the, for that, um, those type of grants that will come before Council and these, uh, these funds will be managed through that program. Any further questions? Uh, I'm happy to move the officer recommendation for item 6.1.5. Uh, but I would like um, to amend the officer recommendation with a new part one, uh, and I will read um, the wording, and it's being projected at the moment. Write to all members of the Community Participatory Budget Working Group to express Council's appreciation for their time and commitment in co-designing with Council and making recommendations for the $2 million Community Recovery Fund. Do I have a seconder? Happy to second that, Chair. Thank you, Administrator Eddy. Uh, I just wanted to make a few comments uh, about this particular report because um, uh, we gave a commitment that we had um, put provision within the council budget for the $2 million COVID Community Recovery Fund that was to be co-designed together with community representatives. And as the CEO indicated, uh, that has occurred. Uh, we had 32 residents who gave up considerable time and effort to participate in a series of workshops over a month and, and really contribute to the co-design of the recommendations. Uh, but what was really pleasing is that we also applied another lens looking at the research that was gathered through the COVID-19 pandemic period and community and business perspectives and other evidence uh, as another overlay in relation uh, to the recommendations that were coming forward. Um, and so I'm very optimistic, and, and as you indicated, um, Mr Lloyd, we will be getting a report back on the fund and the actions um, as they progress every three months. So that's very pl pleasing that we'll be uh, seeing um, the, ev the evolution of the um, plan. Uh, so, again, I'd just like to thank all of the uh, many members of the community who have given so much time and effort to participate with Council, and it really has been a first in relation to a co-design program. Uh, would the seconder of the item like to speak? Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, I was going to make that very point. I do think it's a first. I'm not aware of any other local governments that have used such a strong and robust participatory engagement process for a targeted support program uh, such as this pandemic recovery fund is. It all happened before my arrival and I commend you for, uh, for going down that path. I think it's a terrific way of making sure that this council is being as responsive as it possibly can within uh, the resources that it has to recognise the impacts of the pandemic on its community. Uh, without talking out of school, we received some data today which is going into a lot more detail on the impacts of COVID and it's very clear to me and I'm sure to all that some of those impacts are going to be quite long term and will take um, a, a very long time uh, to, to recover uh, from. Um, there are some particular highlights in here that are worth mentioning. The $400,000 in emergency recovery grants for community organisations, the $400,000 for a support local campaign and to support local business, which fits in very nicely with some other business support activities that uh, we'll be speaking of um, 
uh, later, uh, $150,000 for training in the community to enhance employment opportunities and $110,000 to work with partners to deliver workshops and resources to support young people to be job ready. I think some of those go to the heart of some of the issues that we're starting to hear about that are being impacted by this insidious pandemic and will be with us for, for some time. So happy to second and totally support the work that's been done to date. Thank you, Administrator Eddy. I'll now put the item to a vote. All those in favour, the motion is carried. Item 6.1.6 .6 for decision, construction of the Mernda Social Support Services Facility Contract 2020-17, Tender Evaluation Report. Uh, if I could invite our Director, Infrastructure and Environment, Ms Debbie Wood, to speak to this item. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. The purpose of this contract is for the construction of the Mernda Social Support uh, Service Facility. The delivery, of this, the delivery of this project will provide a social support facility which will include three activity rooms, an office, consulting rooms, a quiet room, outdoor space, kitchen, storage and amenity. Uh, a competitive tender process was undertaken and tenders for the contract closed on the 27th of April 2021. Three tenders were received. Um, there's currently funding allocated to this project in the 21-22 New Works Program and also some allocation of funding through the um, Growing Suburbs Fund um, for the allocation for the funding. Um, so officers recommend that council resolve to accept the tender submitted by J R and B L Kendall P T Y L T D for the sum of two million one hundred and fifty two thousand eight hundred and eleven dollars, excluding GST, uh, for the following contract number twenty twenty one dash seventeen construction of the Mernda Social Support Service facility subject to the following conditions: uh, a the tender to the tenderer to prove of to provide proof of currency of insurances cover as required in the tender documents b price variations to be in accordance in accordance with the provision as set out in the tender documents and c tender to provide contract security as required in the tender documents and to uh, approve the funding arrangements detailed in the confidential attachment Thank you, Ms Wood. Administrators, do you have any questions in relation to this item? No? Uh, do I have a mover for the officer recommendation for item 6.1.6? .6? So moved, Madam Chair. Thank you, Administrator Eddy. And a seconder? Second, Chair. Thank you, Administrator Duncan. Uh, would the mover like to speak to the item? Just very briefly, Madam Chair, uh, if I read the report correctly, the need for this facility in the Mernda Doran, uh, Doreen area um, has been um, identified for quite some time. The Mernda Strategy Plan of 2008, um, I did a double take when I read that, uh, identified the need for this purpose built facility, and here we are some 13 years later. I, I think that just underscores the huge challenges of keeping up with the growth in a, in, a, in a city like this, which is something I'm learning about um, every day. Uh, I'm, I'm sure it's not lack of commitment. I'm sure it's just being able to, to meet up, uh, to keep up with the, with the demand. So um, better late than never, I guess, uh, we would say. A really important project to provide this social support for older residents and day respite for carers. I think in the current environment, even more important, of course, uh, great to see all the different services that can be provided from this facility, and I'm happy to support it. Thank you, Administrator Eddy. Would the seconder like to speak to the item? No need, thank you, Chair. I'll now put the item to a vote. All those in favour? The motion is carried. Item 6.1.7 for decision, proposed planning scheme amendment, inland rail project Tottenham to Albury. Uh, and if I could ask our Director of Planning and Development, Mr Justin O'Mara, uh, to speak to this item. Uh, thank you, Chair. I'd like to introduce Linda Martin Chu, who's our Team Leader of Strategic Projects and Infrastructure, the author of this report, who's going to provide a brief overview of the report and officer recommendation. 
Thank you. Over to you. This item relates to a request from the Australian Rail Track Corporation, or ARTC, that Council review and, if deemed appropriate, to provide a letter of support for the proposed planning scheme amendment to facilitate the inland rail project from Tottenham to Albury. The planning scheme amendment facilitates stage one of the project, which will upgrade to the North East Railway line from Beveridge to Albury to provide greater freight carrying capacity, designing in the ability to accommodate double stacked freight trains up to 1,800 metres long. In terms of the project area and construction impacts, City of Whittlesea is affected in a relatively minor way. One gantry and signal upgrade will be required on the eastern edge of the rail track in Beveridge in the north of the municipality. Having reviewed the proposed planning scheme amendment and noting the requirement for preparation and submission of an environment report and environmental management framework to guide the design and construction of the project, the officer recommendation is that Council resolve to write to the Minister for Planning expressing support for the planning framework proposed by the planning scheme amendment for this significant strategic project. Thank you, Ms Martin Chu. Um, you, uh, I might um, just start off with uh, probably a point of clarification, which I think you've already probably covered in your um, opening remarks. Um, my reading of the report and the briefing that we've had is that the impact within the city of Whittlesea is absolutely minimal, uh, because we're really talking about gantry and signalling update upgrades uh, and so in relation to social or economic effects any noise air quality or environmental heritage issues uh, they're really it's negligible in relation to the impact within the city um, yes that's correct chair um, the project involves 12 enhancement sites along the railway line more, more broadly. Yes. Um, and so obviously there will be community consultation in dealing with all of those. But in yes. Whittlesey, um, we've really just got uh, removing one signal gantry sideways. Yeah. And it's within the existing rail corridor. That's it. Thank you, Ms Martin Chu. Uh, any further questions? If I may, uh, Chair, uh, there's some reference in the report to the Beveridge Intermodal Freight Terminal. I wonder if you can comment on the relevance of this particular matter that we're being asked to resolve on tonight to that project. Is it a prerequisite for that project to proceed? It would be a prerequisite for it to operate properly and also for the WIFT. Either way, mm. this upgrade is required to the, the railway line. Right. So it's directly relevant to both intermodal terminals? Yes, um, in that it provides that network term. upgrade towards Melbourne to Brisbane, essentially. Yeah. And the location of the BIFT, if we can call it that, to this piece of land that we're talking about here? Yes, it's um, directly adjacent to the east and north. Right. And could I just clarify that that is the beverage intermodal freight terminal? Thank you. Thanks. Any further questions? No. Uh, I'm happy to move the officer recommendation for item 6.1.7 uh, with the further clarification. Thank you. Do I have a seconder? Yes, happy to second. Thank you, Administrator Eddy. Uh, I've got no further comments to make in relation to the report. Do you wish to speak to the item any further? Uh, no, not really. Just to confirm that the, you know, the Beveridge Intermodal Freight Terminal is a very important project for the north of Melbourne. I would hate to think that a tiny little piece of uh, Whittlesea was, uh, was going to get in the way of that. So that's one very good reason to be uh, supporting this. Um, I, I think it's also an opportunity just to highlight that it is a key advocacy priority for this council that we see that intermodal freight terminal um, committed to by both levels of government, state and federal, um, in as timely a manner as possible. And I know there's some, some competition with the West, and in a previous life I might have been arguing for the West to have priority. I now find myself arguing that, uh, that the North should, but I think ultimately both will happen. But I just think it's a, uh, an opportunity too good to pass to, uh, to not underscore the importance of that project to the future of, uh, of our, our freight network and our um, e economy more broadly going forward. Thank you, Administrator Eddy. Uh, I'll now put the item to a vote. All those in favour? The motion is carried. 
Item 6.2.1 uh, for decision, local area traffic management and street improvement plan, Mill Park and Epping. Uh, and again, if I could ask Ms Wood, our Director of Infrastructure and Environment, to speak to this item. Thank you, Ms Wood. Thank you, Chair. Um, safe roads for cars, bicycles and pedestrians are an important part of our municipality and form one of the most frequent requests from our community. Um, this report outlines the investigation findings and extensive community consultation for the local area traffic management and streetscape improvement plan recently conducted for the area bounded by McDonald's Road, Childs Road, Morang Road and the future outer metropolitan Ring Road E6 corridor in Mill Park and Epping. Um, the aim of the study is to deliver a wide range of unprogrammed and programmed traffic management initiatives to improve road safety and pedestrian and cycle con connectivity. Um, in developing the plan, a detailed analysis was undertaken of a number of elements, uh, including reported casualty crashes, res resident concerns and record volume and speed data. This was backed up with a comprehensive consultation package, which was distributed to over 33,000 um, property owners and occupiers within the study area, um, investing, inviting the community to provide feedback. Consultation was also undertaken with local bus operators and the Victorian Police. So this work led to the consideration of project imp um, improvements, including local road safety works, street lighting upgrades, pedestrian and cycling uh, pathway upgrades um, and repairs. So the final plan recommends the installation of a suite of traffic calming devices in Prince, Wales, Prince of Wales Avenue, Romanio Avenue and the Fred Hollows Way. Pedestrians and cycling connectivity improvements and installation of raised crossings along Prince of Wales Avenue, Manning Clark Road and the Fred Holloway, Holloways Way. An upgrade of existing unsealed paths within Mill Park Recreation Reserve and installation of wayfinding signage to council facilities. So office, officers recommend that council resolve one, to finalise the draft traffic management and streetscape improvement plan for the LATM 26 and 32 area. Um, and two, subject to council decision, directly inform the local community and provide information to the broader community of the endorsed plan and council decision. Thank you, Ms Wood. Administrators, do you have any questions in relation to this item? There being no questions, do I have a mover for the officer recommendation for item 6.2.1? Thank you, Chair. I'm happy to move, but I'd like to suggest a new part two, um, a little bit different to what was just read. Um, I'm not sure if we've got this to put on screen. Um, so the new part two to read, directly inform the local community and provide information to the broader community of the endorsed plan and council decision, including but not limited to uh, direct mail out to all property owners, occupiers in the study area and those who provided feedback at community information sessions and information where possible at the Mill Park Leisure Centre, All Abilities Play Space and Mill Park Heights Primary School. And happy to move on that basis. Thank you, Administrator Eddie. And I'm happy to second it with the new part two. Uh, would you like to speak to the item? Thank you, Chair. Yes, this is a key action, I note, from the current Council Action Plan. It's about improving road safety and traffic conditions in an area that has pockets of unacceptable driving behaviour, to be frank, and a poor record of casualty crashes, an average of one per year for the last five years. I do commend the rigour that officers have used in developing this plan, both from a technical perspective and from a community engagement perspective and note that it's expected to deliver significant improvements in road safety through reduced traffic speeds and an improvement in the livability of this area for these residents. Thank you, Administrator Eddy. Uh, I, I just would echo your comments but also wanted to acknowledge the efforts of council officers in going a lot further and I think they're in attendance this evening than what was required. Uh, it's all too easy for council officers to simply let a box drop um, residents, ratepayers. Um, and I think the efforts that have been made and the statistics in the report speak to that. 
uh, because we went really from a 5 and 9 per cent response rate to a 52 per cent response rate because of the extra efforts of council officers in doing things such as the telephone um, visits, telephone calls visits, um, the, the flyers, but also notes to call council officers. So I think it is a way forward for council in relation to going that extra step to try to get those response rates. And I think the um, additional part two is really just part of, uh, and I note in the report that there is reference to Mill Park Leisure Centre, but if we can use any of either council or other key um, centres to advertise, uh, I think it is also a very good thing. So again, thank you to the council officers for going beyond what was required uh, in relation to this item, and I'm happy to second it. Uh, I'll now put the item to a vote. All those in favour, the item is carried. Item 6.2.2, and um, Ms Wood, I might ask you if you'd like to remain here. Item 6.2.2 uh, for decision is redevelopment of the Mill Park Basketball Stadium contract 2021-15 tender evaluation report. Thanks, Chair. Thought I got away with it. <laughs> <coughs> um, so this item is just for the purpose of the contract of the, for the redevelopment of Mill Park Basketball Stadium. The Mill Park Basketball Stadium is 30 years old. Um, actually, this year it was constructed by Council um, in partnership with Stadium uh, Sport <coughs> Victoria and the Department of Education. The Mill Park Basketball Stadium is located on the grounds of Mill Park Secondary uh, College and it's the largest indoor stadium in the municipality and home to Whittlesea City Basketball Association. The Whittlesea City Basketball Association currently has a membership of around 4,500, 4, which is expected to grow to around 7,000 um, by the end of the decade. So the current facilities are ageing and restricting the ability to grow and device, diversify. The scope of works include the internal reconfiguration of the foyer, reception, canteen and office spaces, as well as refurbishment of existing public amenities, conversion of non-accessible player change amenities, um, and an extension to create new player rooms and amenities. A competitive tender process was undertaken. Uh, tenders closed on the 27th of April 2021, um, and six tenders, tenders were received. The budget is allocated in the 21-22 New Works Program. So officers recommend that Council resolve to, one, accept the tender submitted by Simbuilt Pty Ltd for the sum of $2,121,695, uh, excluding GST for the following contract number 2021-15, the redevelopment of Mill Park Basketball Stadium subject to the following conditions. Uh, A, the tenderer to provide proof of currency of insurance cover as required in the tender documents. B, price variations to be in accordance with the provision as set out in the tender documents. And C, tenderer to provide contract security as required in the tender documents. And two, uh, approve the funding arrangements detailed in the conf confidential attachment. Thank you, uh, thank you, Ms Wood. Administrators, do you have any questions? I see uh, Administrator Eddie does. Yes, I do. Thank you, Chair. Uh, look, I note that this facility was built in 1991 and you've described it as ageing, so we've only got 20 years out of this building. What sort of life do you expect to get from the new one? Thank you, Administrator Eddie. Um, look, I'm assuming that once we do these works, we'd get at least another 20 to 30, 30 years out of the building. Um, it, it's really around the, um, the fit out. It's not so much about the structure of the building that's not, not working at the moment. Right, okay, thank you. Uh, do I, oh, any further questions? No? So do I have a mover for the officer recommendation for item 6.2.2? I'd like to move this one, Chair. Administrator Duncan and a seconder. Happy to second. Thank you, Administrator Eddie. 
Um, would the mover or seconder like to speak to the item? Uh, just to note, Chair, that um, you, you and I attended the turning of the sod with uh, Minister Lily D'Ambrosio quite a while ago, and to Administrator Eddy, the facilities are very, very old and dated and not functional, including um, disability access into the change rooms. So this upgrade will modernise and um, give more capacity for to be more inclusive um, in our community. And as Ms Wood has said, that the projection is that the membership is going to go up to around 7,000, if not more, because of the popularity of the sport. So. Um, perhaps we'll take Administrator Eddie there to see the building as it currently stands, but it does look like it was built in 1991. <laughs> Thank you, Administrator Duncan. Uh, Administrator Eddie, would you like to speak to the item? Thank you, Chair. The description to me sounds like it was built much earlier than 1991, but I'll take your word for that, Administrator Duncan. Look, I'm happy to support this. The growth in uh, in sport is, uh, is being experienced right across uh, the city. Of course, uh, Whittlesea is no different there and the needs to keep up with uh, the facilities to meet the demand is, uh, is just as strong. So uh, very supportive of this um, recommendation. Thank you, Administrator Ed. Could I also just note, having visited the facility alongside Administrator Duncan, uh, that there are also a number of sustainability measures that are incorporated in the new works, which are very important as well. Uh, so I'll now put the item to a vote. All those in favour? The uh, motion is carried. Item... Thank you. <laughs> Uh, at item 6.2.3 for noting 165 to 185 Gordons Road, South Morang Development Plan. Uh, and again, if I could invite our Director of Planning and Development, Mr Justin O'Mara, and I note Ms uh, Martin Chu is also uh, no doubt going to be speaking to this item. Yes, thank you, Chair. Yes, you're correct. Um, I'd like to introduce once again uh, Linda Martin Chu to provide an overview, overview of the report and offer a recommendation. Thank you. Thank you. This item relates to the proposed 165 to 185 Gordons Road South Morang Development Plan. The five subject land parcels in South Morang are affected by the Development Plan Overlay Schedule 6, which sets requirements for development relating to the existing environmental, landscape and cultural context the location and layout of open space, efficient transport networks for vehicles, pedestrians and cyclists, and for a diverse range of allotment sizes and dwelling types. The proposed development plan was reviewed by Council and revised by the proponent to the extent that these requirements were satisfied and was subsequently placed on non-statutory exhibition to adjoining and abutting landowners and occupiers for one month in January, February 2021. Following consideration of the submissions received as a result of exhibition, further amendments were made to the proposed development plan to ensure that it can support future development of the five separate land holdings within the development plan area. As such, the officer recommendation is that Council approve the 165 to 185 Gordons Road South Marine Development Plan as shown at attachments two and three. Thank you, Ms Martin Chu. Administrators, do you have any questions? Yes, Administrator Eddy. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, um, I note that the administrators have today received some correspondence from the owners of 175 Gordons Road. Um, they state that they believe the proposal is inequitable and unfeasible to pursue based on the conditions that uh, we're putting forward. I wonder if you could respond to the concerns that they've raised? Yes. Uh, yes, thank you, Administrator. Eddie, I'll start off uh, with a response and I'll hand over to um, Ms Martin Chu. The um, submitter that provided some correspondence today is one of the submitters that's referred to in the Council report, one of the landowners that made a submission in the non-statutory um, public exhibition period. The um, submission we received today is um, re repeats some of those matters that were raised in the submission as reflected in the report. Um, as a result of those, um, concerns and, and matters raised by the submitter during the exhibition period. The report does note that it's recommended that there are some changes made to the 
to the development plan, which also includes um, increasing the developable area of that site, which is 175 Gordons Road. Um, but there are some other matters there that, um, that um, are mentioned in the, in the correspondence that um, we can't accommodate, given the need to ensure that there isn't connectivity amongst the, the sites, but also ensuring that we maintain and preserve the river red gums that are on site. Council has a very strong policy on river red gum protection. And um, it's important that we have a development plan that retains those river red gums moving forward. And um, Ms. Martin Chu, would you like to add anything else? Um, thank you. Um, there was a lot of um, communication done with the landholders in the area, in the development plan area throughout the process. But Council's role in this was to advise of the process, as a, we, not, not to advocate for the development plan layout itself. Um, so we've essentially addressed, we've asked the proponent to address the concerns of that landholder, and that's been done to an extent, or to the extent that it's possible under the development plan schedule, noting we have all of these competing priorities, including retaining the river red gums. Um, it's true to say that the, from west to east in the development plan area, the, the tree or the canopy trees increase in number, and so that the net, net developable area on each lot pretty much directly reflects that. And this 175 is, is in sort of the mid-range in terms of the net develop, developable area on the site. So, um, yes, we, we don't feel we can do much more at this stage to accommodate that landowner. So, just to be clear, you're satisfied with your current recommendation and there's nothing in this uh, correspondence today that gives you cause to reconsider what you're proposing? That's correct, Administrator Eddie. And one final question, if I may, uh, not preempting what decision we might make this evening, if the uh, submitters are still unsatisfied, do they have further appeal rights in relation to this matter? They can um, ask for the decision to be reviewed by the Victorian Civil and Administrative Tribunal. Thank you. Any further questions? Do I have a mover for the officer recommendation for item 6.2.3? Happy to move that, Chair. Thank you, Administrator Eddie, and I'm happy to uh, second the item. Uh, Administrator Eddie, would you like to speak to the item? Very briefly, Chair, I know there's a long history to this. The first development plan was in 2017 and there have been some subsequent iterations. Um, the development plan was placed on exhibition uh, earlier this year and enabled comments from abutting and adjoining landowners and occupiers and, and there's been some significant revisions as a result of those processes with regard to the internal road network access, provision of open space and developable area. Um, I thank the officers for their advice on this matter. I'm happy to support the recommendation they've put forward. Uh, thank you, Administrator Eddie, and I'd echo your comments. And um, We have been well briefed on this particular matter and having further considered the responses that have been provided in relation to the new correspondence, I'm happy to second the item. Uh, I'll now put the item to a vote. All those in favour? The motion is carried. Thank you. Uh, item 6.2.4 for decision, planning application 719837, use of the land for industry, asphalt batching plant, and buildings and works, including buildings and works within the land subject to inundation overlay at 29 Greystone Court, Epping. Uh, if I could hand over to the Director of Planning and Environment, Mr Justin O'Mara. Uh, thank you, Chair. I'd like to introduce planner Jessica Higgins, who's the manager who's managed this project um, through to the current decision tonight. Um, so over to you, Jessica, to provide an overview of the report and officer recommendation. Thank you. So this application seeks approval for the use of the land for an asphalt batching plant. Um, it also includes associated buildings and works within the site. So this site is currently being used as a materials recycling facility, and that was approved by a planning permit issued in 2009. So the site has a total area of 35.85 hectares and both uses are intended to run on the site concurrently um, with the uses being interrelated. 
So notification of the application was undertaken and a total of seven objections were received. We have had two objections which have subsequently been withdrawn following successful mediation between all parties. So officers recommend that council resolve to approve the planning application number 719837 and issue a notice of decision to grant the planning permit subject to conditions. Thank you, Ms Higgins. Um, if my colleagues don't mind, I might start the ball rolling. I, I do have a few questions. Uh, I'll ask each of my questions and let you respond to each of them in turn. Um, my first question is that I note in the report that the EPA granted, quote, exemption from works approval for the proposed use subject to odour emission monitoring results. Can you clarify what that latter part actually means? Yeah, certainly. So the works approval sits outside of the planning permit process. Um, so really, um, the, can, the works approval included multiple conditions, one of those being that um, following the approval, within three months of the works commencing, they submit to the EPA um, a report which uh, includes odour and noise emissions monitoring results. So that demonstrates then to the EPA that they comply with the state environment protection policy. So um, the, I would also probably just notice, note as well that the application was subsequently also um, referred directly to the EPA. So we did that under section 52 notice provisions within the Planning and Environment Act. Um, they also didn't have any objections to the proposal um, and they've included some conditions on the permit which are conditions 27 and 28. So the applicant automatically has to submit those results to the EPA That's after correct. three months? That's correct. And will we be notified of those results? No, so that sits outside of the planning permit. Okay, okay. all right, thank you. Um, I note within the report that you indicate and you comment on it this evening that there were a number of objectors. Uh, two uh, objections had uh, been removed uh, as a result of the fact that they had visited a similar operation um, that's b by the current applicant. Can you just provide a little bit more detail as to how that visit um, removed some of the concerns of those two objectors? Certainly. So both objectors visited the applicant's Laverton site. Um, which is significantly larger than what is proposed okay. in Epping. It's about double the size. So one of the objectors was particularly concerned with the odour emissions yeah. um, and following their site visit, they were satisfied. They, were, they stood next to the machinery on the site and they were satisfied that the smell that they smelled then would not be able to be travelling from the site in Epping to their factory, which is only in Greystone Court, which is where this um, uh, site is off. Um, dust emissions at the Laverton site were also demonstrated to be very low. Um, the areas were all fully sealed, which was another positive um, mm. note that one of the objectors uh, included. Um, it's also similar to what is being proposed with this application. So they'll be sealing the entry and exit points from mm. the site and the area on which this use is to occur. The site was noted to be very clean. This is the site at Laverton. Um, they noted there was no dust. And the second objector who visited witnessed the loading of the trucks. Um, mm -hmm. And they noted that the operation was all um, undercover. It was very quick. And the machinery, they could barely even hear when it was in operation. OK, thank you for that. Um, I I'd still do have a few more questions. So. Um, how will we continue to monitor noise, dust, any emissions and environmental compliance? And I know you'll probably say that that's not only council, but equally the EPA has responsibility in that area. But can you just talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, of course. So we continue to ensure compliance with permit conditions via any complaints that may be received. So that's managed through the planning enforcement. Um, we'll also involve the EPA should any breaches of compliance be identified via Council's industrial compliance program, so which monitors all industrial uses within the municipality. Thank you. Uh, my final um, question or questions are that, again, uh, we received correspondence today um, from uh, Contour Planning on behalf of the applicant. Um, and they have specifically 
requested review of a number or removal of a number of the conditions that are being recommended uh, this evening. Um, uh, condition 1G, uh, three parts there, uh, to do with staff bike parking, office area must achieve minimum 30 per cent, um, and uh, certain requirements in relation to lighting, insulation and glazing. Could you please comment on the officer uh, response in relation to the items mentioned in the correspondence? So these conditions relate to environmentally sustainable design requirements, which uh, Council has a local policy which reinforces this uh, to be met for all uh, types of development. Um, and they are considered to be entirely appropriate for the scale and the type of this development as determined by our environmentally sustainable design officer. Um, so yes, you're right, the conditions um, reinforce meeting the National Construction Code, which is essentially building regulation standards um, and requires daylight provision to internal areas. And it's noted that from their concerns raised, um, that it's due to them not being able to meet this because they are repurposed buildings, but um, it is felt by council officers that this can easily be met. Um, in addition, the requirement for bicycle parking provisions, um, these are relatively minor. It's really just a bicycle hoop that's required to be put somewhere on site for parking, um, which could be just at the entry point to the site as it was noted that, you know, there might be, um, uh, you know, conflicts with internal truck movements. So we felt that uh, the conditions all have inbuilt flexibility as well. So um, if anything was deemed to be met, um, meeting the intent of the condition, but not specifically, that can be considered. Um, so we would recommend that these conditions remain in the permit. Thank you, Ms Higgins. Uh, any further questions from administrators? Uh, all right. Well, look, um, given that we've had a number of briefings on this item, and I think you're very comprehensive response to the questions that we've raised this evening, uh, I'm happy to move the officer recommendation for item 6.2.4. Uh, do I have a seconder? Thank you, Administrator Eddy. Um, I don't really um, have anything further to add, given the questions that um, you so comprehensively responded to, um, other than really just to say that there are multiple permit conditions that are being recommended by council, but by other authorities as well, including obviously the EPA and Melbourne Water. Um, would the seconder like to speak to the item? Thank you, Chair, but no thank you, Chair. On that note, I'll put the item to a vote. All those in favour, the motion is carried. Thank you, Ms Higgins. Uh, item 6.3.1 for decision, adoption of the City of Whittlesea Investment Attraction Plan and 2021-2022 actions. Uh, if I could ask um, uh, our Director O'Mara to um, well, introduce uh, Thank you, thank you Chair. Um, I'd like to introduce Kate Weverly, who's our Project Manager in Economic, economic Development, it's a bit of a tongue twister, who's project managed uh, the development of the Investment Attraction Plan. So Kate will provide a brief overview of the report and officer recommendations. And um, thank you, Justin. Thank you, Chair. Um, the Investment Attraction Plan 2021-26 responds to Council's commitment to support businesses to start, grow and prosper, leading to more local jobs across a diverse range of industries, supporting the diverse needs of our resident and business community. The plan seeks to position the City of Whittlesea as supportive, providing business with support networks that empower them to rise above COVID-19 pandemic challenges to innovate and grow. Um, as proactive, going the extra mile so that businesses can pursue their growth plans with confidence and optimism, and as forward thinking, supporting job growth now and into the future. The plan and its actions have been developed by con um, consultants Urbis for Council. It's informed by an analysis of key economic drivers um, and projected impacts from COVID-19, and competi a competitive review, stakeholder engagement 
We targeted businesses, state government, industry, advocacy groups, as well as health, tertiary and trading institutions. By capitalising on key strengths and opportunities, the Investment Attraction Plan seeks to ensure Council's investment attraction activities um, are targeted and effective in attracting both public and private investment for the city. Um, accordingly, um, we recommend that Council resolve to adopt the Investment Attraction Plan 21 20 to 2026, 20, support the implementation of Year 1 priority actions for 2021 to 22, as identified in the Investment Attraction Plan, and write to participating stakeholders um, to invite them to a roundtable breakfast event scheduled in mid-July to thank them for their contribution to the project um, and to demonstrate Council's commitment to supporting investment activity. Thank you, Ms Weatherly. Uh, administrators, do you have any questions? Administrator Eddie. Thank you, Chair. And firstly, can I thank uh, Director O'Meara for not reading the last recommendation, which was about eight pages worth. Um, that was appreciated. Um, in relation to this item, um, it occurs to me that every council would like to be attracting uh, business investment. I wonder how we've benchmarked against what other councils do to ensure that we can be competitive in this space. Mm. Um. Thank you. We um, examined investment attraction functions of other councils, particularly some other growth area councils and those in, in our region, um, and looked at their activities from um, marketing and communication, um, both from their, their platforms and also the content, what, you know, what they're actually um, communicating um, through to how they resource these activities. Um, and also case case manage um, business support activities throughout their throughout their their council, um, and that's informed our own implementation plan. Um, the the economic analysis um, has shown that whilst the city of Whittlesea has strong growth in small businesses, um, councils such as Hume, um, Wyndham, and Casey are actually outperforming the city um, for growth for the larger, medium to large scale businesses, which sort of by, by definition are larger employment, employment attractors. Um, and the action plan that we've proposed um, would aim to steer council in the right direction by really taking a more targeted approach or targeting those medium and larger businesses in the sectors where um, the economic analysis has shown strong capacity for growth. Any further questions? Do I have a mover for the officer recommendation for item 6.3.1? So moved. Thank you, Administrator Eddy, and I'm very happy to second the officer recommendation. Uh, would the mover like to speak to the item? Uh, just briefly, thank you, Chair. Yes, I support this, uh, this plan, um, particularly, again, in light of uh, COVID-19 impacts of the pandemic on uh, the business community, which uh, appears to be um, a, a second or third level news story on every nightly news bulletin these days. I think it's really important that we are thinking about how we can attract business investment to the city and support those that are already here. And I know there's elements of both of that in here, particularly through things like the business advisory panel, which I think we've already announced, um, which I think will be a, a, a crucial uh, engagement um, avenue for the council to be ensuring that it's got its finger on the pulse of what's happening in the business community and how we can best uh, support them. I notice that this has been developed in consultation with business, with industry, with government and educational institutions, which uh, is, is terrific to see. It's got a five-year uh, horizon. Um, there's some elements of innovation in there with uh, quarterly forums, um, tailored communications and engagement, and the enhancement of the business concierge service. So there's a lot in there, and I'm really looking forward to seeing how this all um, contributes to um, attracting that investment and supporting those existing businesses in the city. Thank you, Administrator um, Eddy. Uh, as the seconder of the item, I echo all of the comments that Administrator Eddy's made. Uh, I can remember when we started to talk about the importance of developing an investment attraction plan strategy, uh, and I'm really excited that we're at this point so quickly. 
uh, given the work of council officers in conjunction with Urbis and the consultation process. So congratulations on that. Um, we know only too well that we're one of Australia's fastest growing municipalities and we welcome roughly 8,000 new residents annually and yet we don't have that level of local employment. It's not keeping up. So we've only got 1,800 new jobs created each year. So this is another attempt and as you rightly said, to try to attract medium and compatible medium and large size business into the municipality. Uh, and we'll continue with our strong advocacy approaches, and that's well embedded within this strategy as well, whether it is to the federal and state governments, but also with all of the partners that we work with, whether it's North Link or the Northern Councils Alliance, the Northern, the National Growth Areas Alliance and so forth to ensure that um, we remain competitive and can attract uh, industry into the municipality. So thank you again. And I'll now put the item to a vote. All those in favour? The motion is carried. Thank you. Item 6.4.1 for decision, Cooper Street West Resource Recovery Hub proposals to lease community engagement outcome. Uh, if I could ask our Director of Corporate Services, Ms Amy Montalti, to uh, briefly present on this item. Thank you, Chair. This report is asking Council to enter into leases at its properties on 480 Cooper Street and 335 to 355 O'Hearns Road in Epping, which is within the site we know as the Cooper Street Waste and Resource Recovery Hub, which is a, a state of sig significance. I apologise. <laughs> um, so at its meeting on the 4th of May, um, it was proposed to enter into leases at this site with operators and also go out to community consultation. So this report is asking Council to enter into those leases, resolve to enter into those leases after that consultation. That consultation resulted in no submissions or no comments to Council. Um, it was an informed level of engagement with the community, so it was advertised on Council's website. Um, so the outcome of this is actually, we think, a very good outcome for Council in that it proposes experienced waste operators to occupy that site. And not only that, it provides various in-kind benefits to the City of Whittlesey community. So we feel this is a great outcome and um, propose that you do resolve to enter into these leases. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Montalti. Uh, administrators, do you have any questions in relation to this item? Just one quick one, if I may, uh, Chair. Can you confirm whether the um, the parties to whom we're proposing to enter into leases are the existing um, parties on these sites? Um, on one of the sites, yes. Uh, at the 480 Cooper Street site, no. Currently, it's occupied by Suez, uh, and repurpose it is proposed to be the new lessor at that site. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any further questions? Uh, I'm happy to move the officer recommendation for item 6.4.1. Do I have a seconder? Thank you, Administrator Eddy. Uh, I, I just wanted to make a couple of points because you've already um, done a very good summary of where we're at. This really just simply completes the process that was commenced on the 4th of May 2021 when um, Council resolved to commence the process to enter into the leases and we've had to go through a statutory process. Uh, and I note in the report that we got no feedback uh, in relation to the, the public advertisement of our intention to enter into the leases. Uh, and the only other comment I would make is having visited the site, it is such an important waste and resource recovery hub uh, and um, it's very exciting in relation to the future. So thank you, Ms Montalti. And would the seconder like to speak to the item? No, thank you, Chair. Uh, on that note, I'll put the item to a vote. All those in favour? The motion is carried. Thank you, Ms Montalti. 
Item 6.4.2 for decision, response to petition for replacement of trees along Fielding Drive, Mernda. Uh, and if I could invite Ms Wood to present again on this item. Thank you, Chair. Um, a report on this subject was presented to the May Council meeting. Uh, since then, a number of uh, things have, have um, happened. Council officers have met with the head petitioner and other interested parties on site. Um, it was a really productive meeting. Um, it was good to hear the concerns of the residents and have, we actually physically had a look at some of the issues that they were having with the tree. So it was really um, good to be able to go out there and do that with them. Um, I've also personally spoken to the head petitioner last week just to advise him of this report that um, is being presented and we'll keep him informed as we go forward of the progress. Um, so currently we have two independent um, assessments, an arbicultural assessment as, a, as well as a structural uh, or an engineering as a report. Um, these reports are still being uh, reviewed before we can make our final decision on this matter. So we're really just recommending to have another month to be able to undertake those reviews, as well as do potentially some more consultation with the entire street, not just the petitioners, including the petitioners, but um, everyone that actually lives in the street. Um, so we are recommending that um, we will present another report to August. Uh, so council officers at the moment are just um, asking that council resolve to note the progress report um, and actions undertaken to date, consult with all residents along Fielding Drive, Mernda, including the head petitioner and signatories regarding the final investigations um, and outcomes, and then prepare a subsequent report to the scheduled meet council meeting dated the 2nd of August 2021 to finalise this matter. Thank you, Ms Wood. Uh, administrators, do you have any questions relating to this item? No? Uh, if given there's no questions, I'm happy to move the officer recommendation for item 6.4.2. And do I have a seconder? Yes, Chair. Thank you, Administrator Duncan. Um, all I really wanted to note is um, to probably reiterate what you've already said, Ms Wood, that we've considered this matter a number of times, once in relation to the initial petition and then at last council meeting. Uh, I've got no problem at all for the further time. I just think the critical issues about the appropriate consultation with the residents or effect, affected residents um, in Fielding Drive. Uh, and you've indicated within the report that there's obviously a couple of op options, which is to either remove and replace the existing street, street trees or increase the maintenance regime. So I look forward to finally considering this item at the next council meeting. Um, would the seconder of the item like to speak to it? Just to concur with your thoughts, <laughs> it would be good to finally put this to bed. Thank, Thank you, you, Chair. Thank you, Administrator Duncan. So I'll put the item to a vote. All those in favour, the motion is carried. Thank you. Um, Item 6.5.1 for noting unconfirmed minutes of audit and risk committee meeting. Uh, Mr Joyce, I don't know whether you um, will be speaking to this item, whether you would like to speak oh. to the item. Um, I'm just happy to just confirm that the audit and risk committee is an independent advisory committee of council and its role is to report to council and provide appropriate advice and recommendations. Um, the committee consists of three independent members and yourself, Count, uh, Administrator Wilson and Administrator Eddy as two administrator delegates. So that's why you're very familiar with the minutes. Um, so the officer recommendation is just that council resolve to note the unconfirmed minutes of the Audit and Risk Committee meeting held on the 27th of May, 2021. Thank you, Mr Joyce. Um, administrators, do you have any questions? I think Administrator Eddie does have a question. I do have a question. Thank you, Chair. I wonder if you could um, just remind us of the process. One of the independent members is coming up for uh, retirement. Uh, I believe we've exercised all the extensions we can under the, the Charter. So uh, could you perhaps outline the process for recruiting a replacement member, please? Yes, I will, Administrator. Um, so as you mentioned, Jim, Michael Ulbrick, who's been a member of the Risk and Auditing, Auditing Risk Committee for many years, um, his um, tenure is coming at, to an end at the at 
after the August meeting, um, and the, ten the appointments are made from the start of October for it consistently. So the process in the Audit and Risk Committee Charter, there's no um, specific way we need to recruit. However, in some discussions with the existing chair, the CEO and the um, chair of administrators, we've been looking at the options and the expectation would be to try and um, use um, media such as LinkedIn, Seek and so forth to potentially attract some good candidates. Um, and then there'll be a process to shortlist, um, like any sort of standard recruitment process, to ensure that we get a really good candidate to participate on the committee. And that would be coming through to council for the um, decision prior to any appointment being made. Any further questions? Do I have a mover for the officer recommendation for item 6.5.1? So Thank you, Administrator Eddie, and I'm happy to second the item. Uh, do you wish to speak to the item? Very briefly, <laughs> Madam Chair, uh, I have had the pleasure of attending uh, my first Audit and Risk Committee at Whittlesea as an observer, technically. Uh, look forward to attending as a delegate to the next meeting. Um, Mr. Albrook is going to leave big shoes to fill. Um, I think um, I would just like to uh, commend the process uh, that, is, that has been outlined to ensure that we get some really good calibre options to, uh, to replace him on that committee. And happy to move. Thank you, Administrator Eddie. I've got nothing further to add. I'll put the item to a vote. All those in favour? The motion is carried. Item 6.5.2 for decision, financial hardship policy. And again, if I could invite our Director of Corporate Services to speak to this item. Thank you, Chair. I'm extremely p pleased to recommend this item to Council for adoption, which is the updated financial hardship policy. Uh, and I will read this out if you don't mind. I, I try not to read too much, but the whole premise around the redrafting and updating of this financial hardship policy really goes to the heart of this. Uh, and this is that this policy ensures that regardless of their circumstances, our community will face no judgment and we will be treated with understanding, dignity and respect. Financial hardship assistance will help reduce additional pen penalties and costs that are being incurred by those in the community that can least afford them. So really around that change intact when we're, we're supporting our, our community who are facing hardships, so really treating them with that dignity and respect. Uh, what we are asking of Council tonight is to, update, uh, to resolve the new updated financial hardship policy and also extend our current COVID-19 hardship policy, which ended on the 30th of June. We are asking that you extend that COVID-19 hardship policy because it allows our community who are facing hardship to apply for support in all areas of Council's fees and charges. Council's previous hardship policy only allowed our community to apply for hardship in re regards to payment of their rates. So this allows that continuity for our community to really provide, be provided with that support in all areas of fees and charges for council. Um, in drafting this policy, consultation was done across the organisation, but particularly with staff members who have um, prepared a financial vo vulnerability and advocacy plan that was consulted with local community agencies. And I'm pleased to say that all the recommendations out of that have been included in this updated hardship policy, particularly around that expansion of support to more than just rates, to fees and charges, but also around specific um, treatment for um, community members who are experiencing family violence and the way we interact with those and keep their, um, um, sorry, privacy for them. So I'm pleased to take any questions if you have any on this report. Thank you. Uh, I might start the ball rolling. I've just got one question. Can you just um, give us a quick summary of the difference. How are we currently dealing with financial hardship 
compared to what's being recommended with so, this new approach? Thank you for your question. Uh, currently, we have debt, debt, a debt collection agency who have we, we have engaged, so community members who are experiencing hardship or require specific payment plans would go through our debt collectors to get those approved. That's quite impersonal. It can be extremely daunting for our ratepayers or community members who um, are experiencing hardship. As soon as you hear debt collector, that becomes quite scary for them. What we're um, proposing is to have a hardship support officer to really support our community through that process, provide a real personalised service, and also ensure that the application process is commensurate with the ask. So if a community member is asking for a one-month deferral of their rates, we imagine that we should be able to do that with little to no paperwork and be able to approve that very quickly. Whereas if someone's asking for a larger deferral, we will potentially have to ask for some more personal information, but we really want to make that commensurate with the ask as well as having that touch point internally immediately so that we, we internally have a good idea of who those people are that are experiencing hardship and we can be on the front foot when we're supporting them and also have the opportunity to refer them to other community agencies that can provide further support. Thank you, Ms Montalti. Any further questions? Um, if there's no questions, I'm really happy to move the officer recommendation for item 6.5.2. Do I have a seconder? Uh, yes, Chair, I'd like to second this one. Thank you, Administrator Duncan. I'm really proud to be moving this particular item uh, because I can just see from the summary that you gave, this is just a fundamental difference in our approach and the provisions that we provide. Uh, and such a critical change. So what you described is almost straight away in the previous approach, we went to debt collection, whereas the approach with the new policy is something totally different. So for me, the fundamental changes are that we've broadened the scope of the policy to include not just rates, but fees and charges. Um, and we're really looking to ease the pressure on residents' ratepayers. Um, the fact that we employ a trained hardship support officer to oversee the applications from start to finish in a much more sensitive way, no disrespect, but then can be provided by going straight to a debt collection agency. Um, and I really think that I know for a fact from the briefings that we've had on this item that you did quite a lot of benchmarking in relation to best practice, not just within local government, but also external. Uh, and you've modified the policy on the basis of best practice. Uh, I indicated previously that what I also really love about this new policy is that it's plain English. It's an approach, as you have described, which is totally non-judgmental. It seeks to avoid any stigma, and you indicated also just even in things such as privacy. Uh, and it avoids, hopefully, by and large, the use of um, debt collection agencies. So I'm very excited about the new financial hardship policy and really congratulate yourself Ms Montalti and council officers for the work that's been put into it. Uh, and on just a secondary note, could I also um, perhaps promote the fact that I um, was at the launch and I helped to launch the new financial wellbeing booklet that's been developed by Woodsea Community Connections in conjunction with council last Friday. And that's another key resource that will be available to resident ratepayers. Uh, anyone having trouble, whether it's paying their bills or experiencing financial stress, and it provides a huge amount of information 
on costs related to housing, utilities and education, and it also lists support services available. And that will be on Council's website as well as Whittlesea Community Connections website as well as beyond. So the two, beautiful timing, which are really about supporting our residents' ratepayers. So thank you again for the efforts that you've put into the development of the new policy. Uh, Ms Duncan, would you like to speak to this item? Yes, please, Chair. Um, thank you, Ms Montelty. I think you summed it up perfectly in your opening statements um, around the circumstances that the community won't be faced with any judgment. I think when you are experiencing financial difficulty, um, it's quite distressing, it's embarrassing, um, and it, it can be delicate and difficult. And so I think this new approach to hardship in the community is um, something to commend yourself and council officers on. I think it's very, very good. Thank you, uh, Ms Duncan. Um, I'll now put the item to a vote. All those in favour? The motion is carried unanimously. Thank you. I note that there's no notices of motion. Administrators, are there any items of urgent business? No items of urgent business. Um, item 10.1 um, for noting is are the reports of council representatives and the CEO update. Um, could I invite Administrator Peter Duncan to provide an update to council and members of the public? Thank you, Chair. Just two items I really wanted to note was I attended the Community Grants Online celebration, which was fantastic. So well done to council officers and everybody involved in putting that event together. It was quite good fun. And also um, the reconciliation group meeting, Whittlesea Reconciliation Group meeting was held um, again. So uh, attended that and it was very productive and well worthwhile as it always is, I must say. And um, I think we're really starting to get some traction there and mutual understanding and outcomes. Thank you, Administrator Duncan. Any questions of Administrator Duncan? No? Thank you. Uh, I'll now ask Administrator Eddie to provide a report on any of his activities. Thank you, Chair. Uh, since the last meeting, um, we obviously had a, um, a period of time where there weren't many events. So that's started to, uh, um, we've started to return to a more normal um, way of operating. And uh, one of the highlights for me was uh, representing the council last week at the turning of the sod for the new Mernda Town Centre. Um, along with the, uh, the local member, Danielle Green, who spoke very eloquently about the development in the area that's, that's planned. Uh, that was a highlight. Really looking forward to seeing that project uh, take shape. Um, I've mentioned the Audit and Risk Committee uh, that I've attended as an observer. Um, other than that, uh, looking forward to uh, getting back into the thick of things as we return to something that looks a bit, little bit like normal in the weeks ahead. Thank you, Administrator Eddy. Any questions of Administrator Eddy? No? Um, I, I would like to also make a um, brief report. Um, along with my colleague, uh, Administrator Eddy, I also attended the Audit and Risk Committee. Um, over the last uh, month, I've participated with the Interface Council Group, also had a board meeting of Whittlesea Community Connections, uh, participated with the Northern Councils Alliance, and also as chair of the Yarra Plenty Regional Library Board, we uh, had a board meeting during the last month. Uh, but also we've been very busy, um, mostly alongside the chief executive officer with a number of meetings with local members of parliament. Uh, we had a joint meeting with Colin Brooks MP, Bronwyn Halfpenny MP and Daniel Green MP in relation to the investment attraction strategy. Um, we had a meeting with Tanya Maxwell MP um, regarding the inquiry into homelessness in Victoria. Uh, and then we had a meeting with Cindy McLeish, MP, in relation to regional tourism uh, arrangements. Um, 
I also participated in the COVID-19 Community Recovery Fund budgeting group, uh, which, was, um, which we resolved on that particular item earlier this evening, which was most informative. Um, we had a meeting with Hope Street uh, Youth uh, in relation to the First Response Youth Service, uh, a meeting with Danielle Green, MP, alongside representatives from the City of Nillimbik, um, we participated, all administrators participated with the community yarn uh, alongside um, the CEO and other council officers. Uh, and as I indicated earlier, uh, I participated in the launch of the financial wellbeing booklet with Whittlesea Community Connections last Friday. Uh, and I'm happy to respond to any questions that my colleagues might have of me. No? Uh, could I then uh, invite the CEO to provide an update to council and members of the public? Thank you, Chair. Uh, June was another big month for our community and council as we uh, both supported each other through another period of, of COVID disruption. I'd just like to thank our staff who undertook 7,500 face-to-face visits to businesses in our, uh, all throughout our shopping precincts in particular. Uh, and also thank you to our partners at the Department of Health, Victoria Police and WorkSafe for supporting us through that. It's a significant effort uh, on top of people's normal workloads. And also thank you to all the officers that also were redeployed into COVID cleansing uh, all through a number of uh, throughout the municipality during that time too. Council also made an important decision to support the public health of our community uh, by hosting a mass vaccination hub at PRAC next door here. Uh, the site's now operated by Northern Health after first being uh, managed by DPV Health uh, and is currently operating seven days a week. Uh, and we thank them for the work that they're doing and reached their 50,000th vaccine uh, last week at that centre, which is quite an effort on behalf of our community. Our highly anticipated $25 million redevelopment of the Mill Park Leisure Centre is complete uh, with the aquatics area opening last Friday. Uh, it's pleasing to see that memberships have now passed 2,500 and more than 1,800 uh, Learn to Swim enrolments have already been achieved. We are planning a community opening day next month and that will be advertised quite widely uh, very soon. Um, in addition to NADOC week, which the Chair has already touched on this week, is also Youth Week. Uh, so a number of activities are underway as part of that week. Our youth team is holding a tree planting tomorrow. And on Wednesday, there's a screening of the movie Cruella at the Village Cinema, and there's still a couple of seats left for that if the people are interested. We, it's good to see our community events coming back to life. Uh, this coming Saturday, uh, the Church Street Whittlesea will be the focus of our Winter Weekend series, and there's activities, crafts, face painting, and live music from 10 a.m. And the Farmer's Market is also back again on the 17th of July at the Council offices here. And finally, I touched on this briefly earlier on, I'd like to thank uh, three of our staff in particular, Neville Kurth, uh, who's been deployed off to the Yarra Ranges to assist the council there in a crisis team capacity. Uh, also to Rochelle Mail and Spiros Kinogopoulos. Uh, they've spent two weeks now down uh, assisting La Trobe City Council in the really affected area of Tyralgan. Uh, they're both environmental health officers and they've been out in the field uh, working with local emergency services and staff to uh, to help them with their recovery. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, CEO. Any questions to Mr Lloyd? Uh, yes, Chair. Just with regard to the vaccination, vaccination centre at Prague, how long will that be established there? And is it drive-in, walk-up, or do you have to book or both? Yeah, look, it's a mixture of both. Um, so uh, it's a walk-in centre. Uh, it's advisable at the moment to book, uh, particularly for Pfizer, it's essential to book. You can't just turn up to get Pfizer. Uh, it's fair to say that uh, the centre is scaling back for a month or two um, to be able to cope with the downturn in the number of available vaccines. But it's expected that by about September, as more vaccines arrive in Australia, um, we'll, we'll see a real uh, further drive at that centre too. Uh, it's likely the centre will operate as a vaccine centre to at least the end of the calendar year. Uh, but that's all depending on the, the availability and the take-up of the vaccine. Any further questions? Just a comment that if you haven't been vaccinated to the public, then please do that, because we've all done it. Absolutely. Thank you, Administrator Duncan. 
Uh, not a um, question, but more just a comment. Um, I'd like to echo your congratulations and acknowledgement of staff across the organisation, both for supporting other councils that have gone through um, the um, emergency management disaster through whether it's Yarra Ranges, La Trobe or elsewhere with the severe weather events. Uh, but also the um, really proactive approach in relation to mass vaccination and COVID testing, uh, and a number of council a number of council officers have been involved in all of our response. But uh, I also want to note your particular leadership, Mr. Lloyd. Uh, local government's got extensive knowledge and experience in relation to immunisation uh, and you have certainly led the charge in relation to the recognition of the role that we can play in supporting either mass vaccination or COVID testing. So thank you for all your efforts and our other staff as well. Um, thank you all for the reports and I, I note that all of these verbal reports will be documented in the minutes. Um, administrators, we're moving into confidential business and hence I require a, mo a motion to close the meeting to the public under section 662A of the Local Government Act 2020 for consideration of confidential items, item number 11.5.1 for decision financial reserves review and policy development. Do I have a mover to close the meeting for consideration of confidential items? Happy to move to close the meeting for the reason that you just very eloquently outlined, Chair. Thank you, Administrator Eddy. Do I have a seconder? Uh, yes, I will second that, Chair. Thank you, Administrator Duncan. I'll now put the item to a vote. All those in favour? The motion is carried. So that brings us to the end of the open meeting and therefore I declare the, the open meeting closed. Thank you.